Okay, everybody, it's time to talk about the rise of Western monasticism. As I've already said, monasticism is the second major institution in the medieval church. We've already talked about the rise of monasticism in the East, but mon monasticism in the West has certain uh, distinctive characteristics. First of all, Western monasticism is less mystical and more practical. Uh, yes, uh, they are ascetic, they punish the body, they deny uh, bodily pleasures and even necessities, but not to uh, renounce the, uh, the flesh, but in order to train uh, the flesh for a mission to the world. And so they're seeking uh, Christian athletes for uh, the, uh, the work of the gospel. In the West, monasticism is rarely, if ever, solitary. You don't see the hermits like uh, Anthony and others. Instead, it's communal, following the pattern of Pacomius that uh, they have monastic communities separated from the world, yes, but a, uh, a, a group of those separated uh, to live communally, sharing uh, their earthly uh, possessions with each other, working together to bring about the good of the community, also uh, praying together, studying the word together, uh, devoting themselves together uh, to the Spirit and the Word. And uh, as you remember, some of the Eastern monks uh, had conflict with the Eastern bishops uh, because uh, the monks felt that they were, uh, because of their uh, monastic life, they deserved to lead the church. The bishops were somewhat jealous of the spirituality of the monks. Well, not so uh, in the West. Monasticism was more like the right arm of the church. Now, one of the early monks that are, that, that, that this monk was revered in the West was Martin of Tours. Uh, he started as a Roman soldier and he enlisted for baptism. So he was a catechumen at the time that he encountered a beggar. And uh, Martin had very little, but he divided his cloak and gave half to the beggar. Well, that night in a vision, he saw Christ himself wearing Martin's half cloak. And so he had, uh, when he gave to the beggar, uh, he was actually giving to Christ. Now, Martin left the army and pursued a monastic life, but uh, at one point was acclaimed the Bishop of Tours in France. But even as bishop, uh, he uh, built a uh, monastic cell uh, in his cathedral uh, to uh, continue to devote himself to the ascetic lifestyle. Other monks gathered around him and thus monasticism developed in the West because of Martin's inspirational uh, lifestyle. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the French word for cloak is chapelle, and that's where we get the word chapel. Martin's small place of worship became known as a chapel. Well, uh, although Martin of Tours was an inspirational figure in Western monasticism, the father of Western monasticism was Benedict of Nursia in Italy. And he established a monastery at Monte Cassino in 525. This is up on a tall uh, uh, hill, uh, if not a mountain, there in central Italy. Italy. This monastery was autonomous, it was self-ruling, it was self-supporting, it was an agricultural community. Uh, later on, uh, monasteries became centers for learning, 
where they preserved culture and also monasteries served as hospitals, pharmacies, and hotels uh, because the monks would study medicine and uh, uh, herbs and uh, uh, medicinal uh, drugs. They would offer uh, uh, hospitality to travelers. As you will remember from our earlier study of monasticism, uh, that this movement became popular when martyrdom was no longer possible to demonstrate one's Christian devotion. And so Christians would choose monasticism as, a, uh, as an expression of their self-denial for Christ. So this was one motivation to enter into a monastery in the medieval era. But there were other benefits, such as security. Uh, in a time when life was very unsettled uh, and uh, dangers were around every corner, uh, the communal life in a monastery was more secure. Also, uh, it gave opportunities for education and study, uh, and there were uh, opportunities to rise in your position. So uh, even the poorest could enter into a monastery through study and hard work could rise up to a higher position. And so there are a number of uh, cultural uh, reasons to enter into a monastery at this time. Now, Benedict established uh, a rule of, of uh, faith, a rule of work for uh, his monks. And this is known as the Benedictine rule. It is the uh, widest practiced as uh, the most widely practiced rule in monasticism throughout the world even today all right the first rule was permanence when you entered into a monastery you remained there uh, throughout your life you could not move from one monastery to another if you heard oh the food's better over here or uh, you have more benefits over here no wherever you entered the monastery you remained there and this gave some stability in a time when uh, there was much movement of, uh, of, of communities during that day. All right, the second rule was obedience to the rule and to the abbot. All right, if you submit to uh, the monastery, you, uh, you agree to obey the rule and obey the abbot. Remember, the word abbot comes from the word Abba, father, and so an abbot is supposed to rule in a fatherly manner. Every member of the monastery submits to physical labor because the work of the monastery is hard, whether you're raising crops or tending to uh, flocks of sheep or herds of cattle. Uh, nonetheless, the work is very hard. Everyone must contribute to, uh, to maintaining the, the facilities and to cooking the food, cleaning, so on and so forth. It's hard work. Everyone submits to prayer, and the Benedictine rule calls for eight stations of prayer. The monk prays eight times a day. You know, first thing uh, upon rising, uh, mid-morning, lunchtime, in the afternoon, uh, just before dinner, uh, right after uh, in the evening, and then they would even get up in the middle of the night uh, to pray. So uh, there was much prayer going on. Study was also possible uh, in, the, um, uh, in the monastery, so this was part of the rule. And then there were three vows. A vow of poverty. One may not own any private possessions. Everything uh, belongs to the community. The Benedictine monk must agree to chastity, celibacy, no sexual relations, no marriage. And then, as I've already said, obedience. So these are the three vows of uh, the Benedictine rule. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, Monte Cassino was destroyed uh, by those wicked Lombards in 589. The illustration here is of the destruction of Monte Cassino uh, during World War II. 
uh, the uh, Allies believed that the Germans uh, had occupied Monte Cassino and were using it as a base from which to bombard the Allies with uh, bombs and uh, shells. And so the decision was made to destroy the monastery. Unfortunately, they discovered that their intelligence was wrong. No one was occupying the monastery, which was destroyed for, uh, for no reason. It since has been rebuilt. I've seen it from a distance when I was in Italy, but have never toured it. I've seen pictures, and it is a beautiful building today. Now, in 589, after the destruction by the Lombards, the Benedictine monks fled to Rome, and there they met Gregory. Remember, Gregory had been himself the abbot of a, a monastic community, and he was uh, fascinated by the story of the Benedictine rule. And so he encouraged these monks to spread throughout the West and plant daughter monasteries and spread the Benedictine rule to others. And so that's why uh, the Benedictine monasticism is the most popular form of monasticism in the West and really throughout the world. Now, let's talk about missions in the West and the influence of monasticism on this movement. All right, the first person we look at is uh, going to be our most famous missionary, Patrick of Ireland. You see his life dates there. Uh, he actually precedes uh, Benedict. He is a uh, contemporary of Augustine, although uh, Augustine of Hippo, I should say, although they never interacted with each other. I'm just trying to place him on a timeline with our early church father. All right. Patrick uh, evangelized Ireland, but he came to uh, his, uh, his work as a missionary uh, through a very difficult path. Uh, his, uh, his father and grandfather were both um, officials in the church in Britain, but he himself was only a nominal Christian, but he was captured by Irish pirates taken to Ireland, where he was forced to tend sheep. Well, there he grew in his faith. Uh, he said he prayed as many times as a as hundred times during the day. And then one time in prayer, he heard God's voice telling him to escape, uh, to head uh, east. And once he uh, reached the coast, he uh, boarded a ship that returned him to Britain. Now, this, uh, this story has an application point that God uses adversity to call us to him, both for salvation and for service. I expect that if I could uh, call for a, a raise of hands, I'm sure several of you could point to your lives when adversity uh, a trial, uh, a difficulty in your life uh, drew you closer to God, maybe even brought you to salvation or led you to a greater level of service uh, and devotion uh, to him. Okay, so uh, this is just what happened to Patrick. Adversity had an impact on his spiritual life. Now, <clears throat> When he returned to Britain, he thought he was safe, uh, but uh, he had a vision in which he uh, uh, saw and heard an Irish uh, person calling him back to Ireland, saying, please uh, bring the gospel to us in Ireland. And so he began his study, and he went to Gaul and was ordained there, and in 432, he returned to Ireland. There he, uh, he had a number of witnessing opportunities and uh, established monasteries uh, where his followers would uh, settle 
and study and learn, and that be, they became um, uh, headquarters for a number of missions efforts. Later, uh, the Anglo-Saxon invasion did not reach Ireland. Irish monasticism preferred, I'm sorry, preserved scholarship and influenced Europe uh, for centuries. All right, let's look at Columbo of Iona. Uh, and there is our saint dressed in this uh, frumpy uh, trench coat. Uh, no, this is not uh, Columbo. I'm talking about Columba of Iona. All right, and he was a, uh, a monk who evangelized Scotland. He actually entered a monastery, but then when his clan uh, was attacked by uh, enemies, he actually left the monastery and led his clan in battle. So he was excommunicated for uh, uh, going AWOL and participating in a military endeavor. But while he was exiled, he founded an abbey at Iona. And at Iona, they followed three ideals, chastity, humility, and a community of goods. So very similar uh, to uh, the, uh, the Benedictine rule. He and his followers conducted missions in Scotland. They converted pagan kings to Christianity. And of course, once you convert the king, then uh, you have uh, access to uh, those who uh, are subjects to the kings. In 635, uh, after his death, but later monks from uh, the abbey at Iona, they established a base at Lindisfarne, uh, Scotland, and then moved southward to evangelize northern England. So Columba had an influence on Scotland and northern England. All right, Augustine of Canterbury, we have mentioned him already, sent by Gregory to convert the Saxons in England. The Saxon king Ethelbert had married the Christian Bertha, and so uh, he and his clansmen converted in 597. Augustine settled in Canterbury. Canterbury then became not only his headquarters, but became the seat of religious life in England uh, until even today. It became the leading cathedral in the Catholic Church, and then even after the Protestant Reformation, it became the, uh, the high church of the uh, Church of England. But nonetheless, even though he settled in Canterbury, had success uh, there, he was unable to unite the Saxon Christians with the Celtic Christians. The Celtic Christians coming from Ireland uh, observed Easter uh, on a different day than did the, uh, the Saxon Christians. The, uh, Easter, as you know, is based on the Jewish feast day, the Passover. Jewish calendar being lunar, uh, this day changes from year to year. Augustine, representing the Roman Catholic tradition, he taught that uh, Easter should be celebrated on the Sunday following Passover. No matter what day uh, of the week Passover was observed, Easter was observed the following Sunday. Now, Columba and the Scotch-Irish Christians that uh, he had influenced, they celebrated Easter on Passover, whatever day of the week that fell on. And so, those who uh, observed uh, Easter on the Passover ended their fasting and began to celebrate. But the Roman Christians continued to fast until 
their observance of Easter on Sunday. And so some Christians would be feasting while others were still fasting. And so Augustine was unable to bring union between these two factions of Christians. All right, the resolution to this problem took place at the Synod of Whitby. Uh, the king at that time was, uh, and his queen, uh, held to different uh, uh, faith traditions. And so, as I said, one would be feasting while the other was fasting. And so at the Synod of Whitby, they brought the Christians together and uh, the Roman uh, representative uh, told the king that uh, the city of Rome, uh, where the Roman church uh, was founded, they had the bones of Peter and Paul, and Peter held the keys of the kingdom. And so the king said, I'm going to go with the church where the bones are, all right? And so uh, all of England was united along the Roman Catholic pattern of Easter on Sunday. All right, one other uh, missionary monk was born with the name Winfred in England. He was an Anglo-Saxon. He entered the monastery, but he desired to be a missionary. He heard stories about uh, the pagans in Germany who needed the gospel. And so he uh, left the monastery, traveled to Europe, uh, became closely associated with the Pope in Rome who gave him the name Boniface. And so uh, Boniface then uh, went to Germany. He would, in every uh, region, he would find the chief or the prince, convert him, and then baptize him and his followers and teach the people. Now, because of his strong connection to uh, the Pope, he ministered under papal authority. And uh, in this region, what is, uh, is now Germany, uh, but you know, also uh, the region encompassed uh, Gaul at the time, uh, two major figures were Charles Martel and Pepin the Short. We'll talk much more about them very soon. But uh, uh, Pepin was, uh, 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 was appointed as the king, and so Boniface anointed Pepin and thus showed the union between church and state. Now, there's a legend uh, about Boniface's uh, ministry to the pagans who worshipped a great oak tree that was dedicated to Thor, all right? Uh, not the Marvel superhero, but the Norse god. And uh, Boniface uh, brought uh, the pagans to this tree and claimed that he would demonstrate the power of the one true God. He took his hatchet and with one stroke chopped down this sacred tree which fell down in the shape of a cross and the pieces of the tree were used to build a chapel dedicated to the apostle Peter. Boniface's life ended when he and 30 catechumens, these new converts, were uh, traveling from one place to another and they were attacked by a heathen mob. Boniface insisted that they not resist, and so they all were martyred, uh, ending with uh, uh, a Boniface's death. So, uh, as we uh, bring our study of the Western Church uh, through the 8th century to an end, I just want to point out uh, the interaction between missionaries and monasticism and the papacy. Missionaries uh, came out of the monastic movement. We think of monks as uh, isolated uh, in their cloister, but actually in this period of time 
uh, the monks were known for their missions work. And so the monasteries produced the missionaries. Popes uh, were influenced by monasticism and they were willing to use these monks uh, as missionaries. And so uh, these three movements were tied together sometimes where uh, the popes would appreciate the, the monastic movement. M many of the popes came out of the monastic movement. They sent uh, monks on missions and so the missionaries then uh, worked in association with popes to bring about the conversion of, uh, of, of uh, pagans in distant lands. All right, so uh, popes, monks, missionaries, they often work together during this period of time. All right, there is our study of the Western Church. We will return to the uh, topics of the papacy and the monasticism at other times. I will, uh, as you will see, I will kind of organize our uh, lessons uh, according to themes, and we'll talk about the papacy during a period of time, the monasticism during the same period of time. So you'll see how this works out, and I hope you'll be able to follow and learn about these, uh, these heroes of the faith uh, even during the medieval era. Okay, thanks for attending to me during this lecture.